Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I uh, am very pleased to be able to uh, uh, thank you all for coming to this showing today of uh, Revolution 67. Um, Carter and English is uh, very proud to be part of this. Um, our firm has its roots in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, I'm old enough to remember when these events occurred. Uh, it was a very extraordinary time. It's a very extraordinary time now. So I'm looking forward to having a share, uh, an experience of going back in time talking about the events that uh, were part of that tumultuous period and, and then relating them to what's going on today. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the film. Thank you. 
that will allow us to also delve into some of the issues that got us to where we are today. I know that this panel is incredible because I've been communicating with them. You know these folks because you have known for years that they are dedicated to Philadelphia. They are dedicated to Black Philadelphia. And they are dedicated to the intellectual codification of the people of color in the city. I am excited that I will be able to bring all of them to you today because they are uniquely qualified to illuminate this history, but also to kind of put us in our right frame of mind about where we go today after the things we've experienced this week. So part of the most important, anytime we do a program, the most important thing that we do is hear from you. So they're all brilliant, they're all smart, we're all prepared, but the most important part of this conversation is you. So I do hope that you enjoy this panel. I do hope that you enjoy the panel discussion, but I also hope that you take the time to really synthesize the information and ask the question that you want answered, and hopefully we will be able to accommodate your request. So I wanted to bring up the panel members very quickly so that they can introduce their film, and then the next thing you will see is Revolution 67. Thank you all so much for coming. what we are, what we have been, hopefully influencing for the better what we will become. I think about trying to tell a story through which you're going to discover a piece of the world you maybe see every day without really looking at it. I don't want to live in a world that says poor people should die only because they're poor people. For 20 years, POV has brought us films that shape our world. The only thing that's not normal is the Boy Scouts policy, which discriminates against gays. Challenge our perspective and allow us to see ourselves <laughs> in a new way. I'm a strong man. Like, oh, what's your name? Frederick Douglass. I'm strong. Amazing panel discussion. I'm going to ask you to take a moment to think about the questions that you want to ask the panel members. And I'm going to ask you to First, we have Dr. Malefe Kente Asante, who is a professor of African and African American Studies at Temple University, Dr. Asante. Fundamental look at the Newark situation. 
situation, there was one issue that seemed to me was not really illuminated enough. You know, I, I'm from the old school. I grew up in Georgia. And I was a, I'm, a, I'm sort of a veteran of the 1965 Watts uh, Rebellion. I was in UCL, uh, I was in California uh, in 1965 when that happened. So I was not back east, I was out west. And one of the things that struck me about the film was that the crux, maybe two or three people mentioned it, that the crux of the problem is really white racism. And I did, I did, I, I have never, I've always heard discussions about all of these issues. Why are these issues here? Why, why is it that white people move out of the city? What is the pro, I mean, so what I would love to have seen is a discussion with white folks. What is it about the fact that in Newark, you have a situation where um, this, uh, where, where, the, where, where the trigger is the same trigger in city after city, where you have a white police who brutalizes a black driver. This is what happened in Los Angeles. It was the same situation. And, and so what you have here in this country, I think in the country, underlying everything is this principal issue that we don't like to deal with. How are white people socialized in America? I really would like to see a film on that. What socialized? What, what causes this? What's the, you know, it's not the black people who cause this. It's not the African American people in North who are the problems that create the situation. We respond to the problem. We resist colonization. We resist imprisonment. We resist terror. We, we resist it. But the fundamental issue, it seemed to me, or at least one of the issues that ought to have been dealt with, that I would love to have seen dealt with, is who are these people who are generating, year after year, these incredible situations that create the lack of educational opportunity, for example, just one. What is it, and the only way I think that African people can respond is the way African people have responded, and that is with a sense of agency. This is why I've always said that it's an Afrocentric solution is the only, only problem, only way to deal with it, is that we have to have our own agency. We have to act. And the people who were activists acted out of their own sense of self-preservation, you see? So, so I, I, I like the film, but I am, I am, I'm always struck by how we only touch the surface and we don't really deal with it. What he said. Um, it's just amazing. I'm sitting here listening to Dr. Asante and I'm impressed with everything that he said and agree wholeheartedly with everything he said. But at the outset, I just want to say thank you to April and to McCarter English and to the filmmakers because I think they provided us with a wonderful opportunity to deal with something that's critically important to most of them around the world. And uh, I'll make it brief because we have some great panelists here, but uh, in terms of a one-word description of the film, I would say motivating. Uh, because for me, anger motivates me. Far too often people get angry and they just wring their hands and they just say how outrageous it is and just walk away. But I think we should use our anger. A situation like this is kind of like vitamins. And that would empower us to, to do something about it. Again, I agree with everything Dr. Sante says, and I will add to it by saying clearly, racism is a problem um, that creates situations like Newark and Watts and Philly and Detroit and every place else, but also classism. It's not just racism, it's also classism, um, because we got a lot of influential and wealthy black folks. Uh, we have a president of the United States, but things for the average person in Newark will not change because of President Barack Obama. So clearly, race is an issue, but um, class as well. Um, 
one of the things, and I'm sure toward the end of the uh, discussion, we'll get into some solutions because we all know what the problems are. Uh, but for me, solution, and I think it was touched on during the film, uh, deal with education of black folks and employment of black folks. But like they say, a fool and his money are soon parted. So if you give a confused, culturally confused black man um, an education, he can count, he can read, he can write, and then you give him or her a job, that doesn't change anything. So we go back to Dr. Sante and raising the Afrocentric consciousness because Clarence Thomas is black, Condoleezza Rice is black, so that really doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I too want to thank um, the producers of the film, those also who produced the program. And I was pleased to bump into Peter Boyer, I guess I'll let you live this down, who reminded me that he was sitting in a classroom at the University of Pennsylvania 40 years ago when I was coming in with my dashiki and my kufi oil and my son, when this is right, raising hell and trying to go to jail. And um, he said it had such a profound effect on him uh, during that time. Um, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Malefi has said. I think the thing is when we take a look at, um, at racism, what happened in 1968, I was able to help create um, a required course on American racism at the University of Pennsylvania. It is required. You cannot get the master's degree in social work unless you take uh, a year of um, uh, one, the first semester is on American racism, that's the history. The second part of it is um, institutional racism and social change. What are you going to do about it? And I agree with, uh, with Mike. I, I, it's hopeful that, the, that we'll talk a lot about how we got to this point, but more importantly, what are the lessons learned? Uh, what are the things that we've created that can be used as a template? As to the film, I think the film is all the things that you guys have said, and I think that what happens is it's only half the story. And I think part of the problem with, with, with uh, Tom Hayden, one thinks an American hero, and those guys in, 19, in the 1950s, 1960s, when there was a clarion call uh, for white people to go into white communities and can challenge the, uh, the, the, the origins of white racism, these guys didn't do it. Uh, but eventually they'd be forced to do it. And of course, then what happened is you had the leverage of blacks trying to dress it inside where they were and whites doing it over there. I'm 75 years old. And I, when I look at that film, uh, I, I have both sadness, uh, I want to cry, uh, I want to rejoice about the resistance, um, but I just simply feel the pain and the passion. And I tie that to uh, the early beginning of how, in fact, Africans came to this country and the failure for black people and white people to just totally ignore that long train history. And this is something so, so terribly, terribly tragic. I mean, we have to remember that history. We have to go beyond that and remember the two holocausts on this shore. The Native American people, that was a holocaust. And the Africans, that was a holocaust. And it must be addressed. And I'll end by saying, I got my origins in 19, um, between 1947 and 1957, it was 10 years, I was in the gangs of Philadelphia. And I learned how to organize. And between 1947 and up to 57, I was effective as an organizer in terms of bringing the gangs together and having total coalitions across the city of Philadelphia. I'll end on that and say, when I talk to you, I just want you to remember that, that I started going to jail at age 11 for fighting and for disruptive behavior and riot, and all the way up to high school where it's the same thing and, and almost for, for attempted murder. I want you to remember that was my origin. So when I talk to you, uh, this evening. You want, I want you to understand where I'm coming from because I'll be talking about how that, those skill sets that I learned yeah. and the consequences of my adverse behavior, how that helped me do all the kind of organizing stuff that I'd be called on to do from 57 going forward.
basis, as we said, the motivation to have this type of dialogue and to have others probe into some of the questions that have been raised and things that haven't been addressed. What we wanted to do was really get people organizing and part of that is now forming these important alliances, not only with like the educational system in our own communities, by creating a curriculum for the film, which is going to be unveiled in a week or so in the Newark Public School System, and have young people start to talk and take oral histories and become engaged in their community and think that there could be change. Because one of the most distressing parts has been the question about, is this, you know, are the stats so depressing, as some people mentioned? and that there's nothing to be done. And certainly, we've gotten a sense that there is work to be done, but it has to be done through organizations and planning and hard work, which um, we have discussed at great length. Uh, yeah, when we made this uh, documentary, we were very prepared to uh, talk about the renaissance that the media talks a lot about in Newark. And uh, so we tried to find uh, uh, evidence of that. And, you know, we just kept running up against the same thing. Um, poverty rate, unemployment rate is so high. And simply that, fortunately, nothing's being done about that. So we couldn't end our film on this great note that, yes, you know, it's like you've heard, Newark is undergoing a renaissance. It's not, and I guess that wasn't so much of a surprise, but it really surprised us that we, we just couldn't say that. You know, we had to say it like it was, that Newark is hurting, you know, and the 25% poverty rate we need jobs, we need, we need a lot, lot to be done in the city. So we, we looked at a film for 90 minutes about New York and we were in Philadelphia. So I want us to now kind of think about what's happening in Philly, what's happening in Philly. And it struck me as I was doing research on this that during the New Deal, there was sort of a liberal cooperative politics between folks in power, meaning white or whatever, and African Americans and their social agency. And Philly was a really great space for that, that kind of coalition building. And then when we moved sort of into the black power politics that came later, it seemed that there was a frustration with the liberalism of that time not being effective. And especially Dr. Palmer and Dr. Asante, and, and Mr. Port, I'll give to you in a minute, because I think you come in at an interesting point for this. Especially when we look at now that we seem to return to kind of that liberal alliance politics with the election of this latest president. All three of you have really talked about the fact that we have sort of pronounced change, but it's not systemic. And I know that that's a constant, constant issue for those of you who are on the ground doing this type of work, those of you who are educators who are shaping the dialogue about this. So I was wondering if you could fill in the blanks a little bit, if you could start with Dr. Palmer, um, because of the work that you've done. Fill in the blanks about what happened with the New Deal. How did we get into the, the ethics of what we were doing in, in the Black Power Movement? And you know, there, there are some people who say because the Black Power Movement was about the gun and the, the ocular metaphor of the gun, even though they were doing all these great programs with the med medical programs with the clinics and the breakfast programs, that whole perception allowed them to be targets in ways that kind of led to their demise. So, so where do we go after that? The um one of the people who's in the audience is uh, Dr. Bobby Lomax and his beautiful wife, Beverly, sitting over here. Um, these folks also lived the experience. I don't know how many other folks are here from that time period when all of them were out there in the 1950s and 60s. Bobby and his wife uh, supported so much of the work we did. Here's an extension of a man's very successful. It was a case for us trying hard to bring the middle class and upper middle class educated black folks together with people like myself who came out of the streets. I would eventually be able, by 1957, to um, finish training at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in cardiopulmonary care. What I was able to do is take um, my experience in the gangs and organize other gangs and my celebrity status in the medical field, and those were the vehicles that allowed me to be involved in the movement. I could not go down south because of my, my experience in the gangs. It was inconceivable for me to go down south, be spit on, and, and to be harassed or be attacked. I wouldn't care if it was a policeman or, care if it was a, or, or just a citizen who would attack me. I'd fight him back, and, and I would hurt him before God got the message. So clearly, I decided to do something here, okay? And what I did was, in the 1950s, is I created the Black People's University of Philadelphia, for some of you who are old enough to remember that. And somebody's raising their hands in the back. And, and Black People's University was, uh, we kept it going for 30-some years. 
And that was taken in young children, young black kids, to try to prove that young black children could learn and could grow and develop as much as anybody else. And the tenets of that was to teach them such principles as our grandparents told us, yes sir, no sir, may I thank you, please. All the kind of socialization stuff that was the positive stuff of the black experience. And to teach them about the fact that they didn't have to live within sort of a four block radius, because all of us who came to the gang experience were living in terms of a territorial imperative. Now how could we get these kids to get beyond that? So we exposed them to such things as the National Geographic, right? And where the, there were black people and Asian and European people all over the world. And so our world had to get beyond just the gang turfs that we lived in. And ABCs and the writings and, and math and so on, that was tertiary. And I say that today. Here it is some 50 years later, I still contend that it is that socialization process, the historical condition of which we come through, that is paramount, is paramount for the, getting these children to move towards ABCs, and to get them socialized and organized, the world is bigger than, than where we are. But then between 57 and 67, we started creating the various kinds of uh, agency that, that uh, uh, Malefi talks about. Uh, we created such things as the, and, and Black People's University was central in much of this stuff. Uh, we created the Black People's Unity Movement, which uh, in fact, uh, uh, Bubby and uh, his wife and all the family were involved with. And that was an attempt for us to organize all the blacks across the city of Philadelphia into the whole idea of what we call operational unity and trying hard to operate on those things that are in our best interest. And we play, Philadelphia is, like Du Bois said before us, is a great, great place. People look at Philadelphia and they don't quite get it. Philadelphia has been the template for the rest of the nation. When things happen in the Keystone State, Keystone, right, it winds up going across the north and northeastern corridor. 80% of all Americans live in the northeast corridor from Philadelphia going further out northeast. And so it was here in 1967 that we all got together and created the place you're sitting in. We created this with the middle class Americans like Fred Sam Evans and Clarence Farmer and others and the black movement created this place you sit in now. Richard, um, um, who the, the curator here, okay, uh, is the person who was a part of us who put the murals on the church at the Advocate on 17th Street. Everything, all change is planned. You fail to plan, plan you, pl you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So consequently, we never talk about the history of the planning. I do not want to be remembered as somebody who's a black activist. That is not what I, I want to be remembered as somebody who really was careful and thoughtful about how we were able to move from point A to point B. We were called upon out of the Black People's University. In 1967, they had the, the uh, black, per, black Power Conference in Newark. 68, they called and asked us to have it in Philadelphia. We organized it in Philadelphia, and over 5,000 people from all over the country came here. We gave definition to the concept. In 1968, we, we organized here around the anti-war. People all over the country asked that we, it was in Philadelphia. Ron Karanga came here in the 67, 68 period to ask that we'd take Kwanzaa and push it along the eastern seaboard because he only had it in California. I'm trying to make the case to understand the kind of planning. In 67, young high school kids and gang kids came to us and asked would we help them plan to, uh, to, uh, to affect change in the public schools. We organized the first black people, black um, um, student unions in the junior high schools, the high schools, and the colleges. It was organized, ladies and gentlemen, organized. We took 90 days to train the, the government kids in the high schools, the junior high schools, and the student unions, and the kids in the gangs on how, in fact, to organize and take over their schools. November 17th, 90 days later, Bobby, Bobby remember? 19, uh, in 1967, November 17th, we had created the largest student uprising in the history of America, where 100,000 black children walked out of the public schools, and 30,000 or more marched on the Board of Education in 67. Okay, it turned into a police riot. But before that happened, those children had been trained how to organize and how to negotiate. They got 25 demands back. Mayor Dibble, Dilworth and Mark Shedd agreed to 25 demands. People remember the fact they asked for black history because we had planned on that as being one of our major issues. But they also asked for a handbill. They wanted a bill of rights, a student bill of rights. They wanted the right to, wear, to have their African names, to be able to wear natural hair wear African clothes, have black teachers, black administrators. They wanted parent control. They wanted community participation. Dave Hornbeck, who was a young man working with us as a student, came back eventually after he got graduated from divinity school. He became the superintendent over a black candidate. Why? Because planned organization of those teenagers wound up having a young man by the name of Dave Richardson, who we trained, who became the youngest state representative of the history of Pennsylvania. And so he 
head of the Black Caucus made a decision that Dave Hornbeck would in fact be picked over the black candidate because there was, there was historical memory. And once again, thinking that he would work with the community for us to be able to build. Then came the Pan-African movement. They, here in Philadelphia, they asked Black People's University to work with them. We created that and went to Bermuda. In 1964, I created the Freedom Theater, me and Walt Delagod, out of Cheney State University. I'm only saying to you that we were always, always at the vortex, always in the, in the planning stages. Malefi, in fact, he's asked me to come to this class for a number of times. In 1967, we fought Temple University for expanding North Philadelphia. One of the upshots of that was we wanted the black courses on, Ameri on African American history. That's how it got there. It would not be until Malefi came that it got turned into more than a, a course, into a department. And he clearly had built it into a, one of the finest departments in the, in the country. Planning, 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 and people constantly talk to me and ask me to talk about these issues. Yes, I've lived through them. Yes, I've gone through the beatings. Yes, I've gone through the jailings. Yes, I've gone through all that. But what I want to die with, remembering most of all, that I gave my life to trying to figure out a way, a solution out of this. Because the legacy that Malefi talks about, this whole notion of white racism, which is a social construction that is born out of Europe, that has been brought in here and colonized in the 1600s, okay, is something that has made this country be the peculiar institution that no country in the world has experienced or practiced racism the way America has. We have taken race and made it something totally different because here in 1640s, when they created the slave codes, it meant that for black people forever and all future generations would be less than a person, less than a human. And for many, many people, right, they still perceive us that way. And they systematically put it into all the institutions. Every institution in America, unlike Britain, unlike France, unlike almost any other country, which never started with the slave, uh, with the slave uh, system and never built their capitalism or their wealth on slavery, this country did it. This is the country that took Africans and made them non-persons. This is the country that raped and killed and plundered and murdered Africans. This is the country that made black women have to have babies that they would take from them at birth in order to build this country and create the privilege that we have. And for many white people, I'm telling, I know what very well. It is not something that they created, but it's something that you and I, others have to take responsibility for, because we live in America. We live in America. And what happens is we have to recognize the fact that something wrong was done, and we have to correct it. And we have to, just, we have to deconstruct every conceivable evidence of racism in American society if, in fact, we want to take advantage of being a post-racial society. Because Barack Obama being made president does not make it a post-racial society. Only when we deconstruct it will it be one. <laughs> And, and when I say it's a mix, I think that there are some people who understand these terms that we're throwing out and some people who don't. So I need for you to help me out. And when you say white supremacy, I need you to break that down. Because I think you hear it, but you don't know what it is, you don't know how it functions, you don't know what, it, you don't know what the impact is. And I, I think we need to have that conversation because what's happening is when Dr. Palmer talks about a post-racial society, we, that, we're hearing this a lot with this new president. But I, I think we are a nation that no matter who you are, we haven't talked about race, which is a social construct. We know that, but it does have weight and gravity. So if you could delve into that a little bit, and then bring us current with regards to the Philadelphia question. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would like to say that, um, okay, you can hear me. I don't know whether the mic is on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me just say uh, that white supremacy in the American context, and, and, and Walter has sort of, you know, blew everything <laughs> way out. I mean, he, he was right on the button. But white supremacy in the American context really refers to the institutions that support and preserve and advance white privilege over everybody else in any instance. Whether you were at the university, whether you were in a corporation, whether you were in a school, uh, whether you were in a uh, museum, whether you were working uh, uh, for the bus company, white privilege is the cornerstone of the projection of this notion 
of white supremacy. And it's based fundamentally on the idea that came out of child slavery, that African people were basically property. So, and had no rights uh, for anything. And this is, this, is, this is a holdover. I always tell people that the North thinks that it won the Civil War, but basically the South won the Civil War because their attitudes became the attitudes that were infused in the institutions of American society. So what we have to deal with, I think, ultimately, is in everything, is how do we, how do we teach white people that their privilege uh, should not be a privilege based on race or on color, and that that privilege should be extended to everyone. I mean, that, that's the, the key. I mean, if I if take it in a more practical sense, I mean, if we take, for example, um, uh, whether you take it in a, in, a, in a corporate sense or in a, in a, in a working sense uh, or in a medical sense or in a sense of banking, a, a legal sense or a filmmaking, whatever the field is, if you have a situation where you recognize, as Tim Wise says, and I think Tim Wise is very clear on this. If you don't know Tim Wise, you ought to know him because he's probably the clearest white person I've seen, I've heard in the last 15 or 20 years on this issue. And Peggy McIntosh. And Peggy McIntosh, right. But Tim, Tim told me the other, he was very, very clear. He says, you know, White privilege is so deeply embedded in America that white people don't even know they have it. They don't even recognize that it's privilege. For example, um, when I got ready to create the PhD program at African American Studies at Temple University, you know what some white people told me? Over my dead body. Why? Well, what's wrong with African American Studies, PhD? Why do white people feel they have a privilege to have 87 departments that are white departments, you can't have African American studies department. You see, they, 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 don't, they don't make the computation. You see what I mean? These are these are the these are the problems. This, this is a simple problem. But or take the the course that we finally got approved in Philadelphia. I'm gonna come back to the issue. We got the African American history course made a mandatory course in Philadelphia, where the population of school children, of black school children, is larger than any other group. It took almost 40 years to get that done. Why? White privilege. White folks said no. And why do they say no? They say no because this is to maintain a sense of white supremacy. So part of what we have to do is always fight and struggle for something that ought to be clear. I mean, why would you not want black people to, and white people to learn black history? What's the problem with that? Why, why is that a problem? It's only a problem if you have a problem with black people. James Baldwin said years ago that the problem is not uh, a problem that black people have. It really is always a problem that white people I don't see anything wrong with having a course in African American history, or, or, uh, or I don't see anything wrong with African American people expressing themselves. Uh, with even with, with you know, and the beautiful thing, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going on here now, a couple of points, but Barack Obama. You know what I love about Barack Obama's election? He's a black man elected to the presidency with an African name. There are a lot of white folk who are scared about that. And there are a lot of black folk who are scared about that. You know, this is, but this is a, it, it, it's like the Afro that was mentioned in the film. The Afro was the most revolutionary thing that black women did in the 1960s. <laughs> you think about it. Very revolutionary. And this Barack Obama was revolutionary. Thing for the African American, I'm talking about for the African American community because there are black people who are scared to use African names. You see what I mean? And why are black people scared to use African names? Because if you use African names, white people won't promote you. This 
is what we, I'm telling you what the problems are in terms of white privilege and white supremacy. Black people are affected by it. So black people say, I can't use an African native because if I want to get promoted in the Department of History, they say, he got an African name, he must be a revolutionary. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Now let me go back to the New Deal and the New Era in Philadelphia. In 1967, uh, when, when we had the big demonstration here in Philadelphia, Stephen Gerard, you know Gerard Avenue? Yeah. Stephen Gerard was, uh, was, uh, was French. And what, he had, what had happened was that uh, uh, he had received money. He had received money. If you, recall, you know this story, he had received money uh, because after the Haitian Revolution, during the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Lourdes would gave him, gave him money to, to keep, right? Uh, they put Toussaint in, in prison. The French put him in prison. Uh, and what he ended up doing, what Girard ended up doing was building Girard College, giving money to start Girard College for uh, orphaned white boys. They didn't allow black people in to Girard College for a long time. And in the 60s, there were the demonstrations that Walter was, a, was a deeply involved in this whole struggle. And the people of his era, they were deeply involved in the struggle to try to get Girard College in Philadelphia to open its doors to, to black orphans. And this, but this was a part of that whole ongoing struggle. Now, here's what I think about the New Deal and the New Era, because I'm hearing the New Era these days. Here's what, here's what I'm thinking about that. If you remember, black people before uh, Roosevelt's second term were Republicans. We were, we were Republicans. We, we, became, we became convinced to go with the Democrats during the second term of Roosevelt. He had three terms. We, 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 we were convinced. And that's when you get the great shift in the black population, where black people start voting Democratic. However, when I look at this era, I see similar kinds of things, and it brings me back to the film because I'm thinking, wow, we're in for a big recession or perhaps a depression. What are going to be the racial tensions in America given the economic situation and the downturn in unemployment? Who's going to be blamed? And that says to me that if we look at what happened, the Democrats were able, at least during the Roosevelt era, to develop programs to try to put people to work. But there were also things that were developed, as we discovered about the mortgages, that also kept black people out of the mortgage market. So we have to be careful and we have to be vigilant that we don't have similar kinds of situations happening even now, even though there are people who are saying that we have a post-racial president, which of course we may get into later on, uh, but uh, I, I don't think we have a post-racial president. I don't think we have a post-racial country. I think we had a wonderful coalition, and I think the coalition of, uh, of uh, liberal and progressive whites and a, and a solid core of African uh, Americans and a majority of Latinos made it possible for us to have the first black president. And that's a good coalition. But I'll tell you one thing, I was in Mississippi on uh, November the 4th, 2008. I had left my ballot here and I went to Mississippi. I was at uh, Mississippi State University. November the 4th, 2008, do you know how many white people in Mississippi voted for Obama? 12%. 12%. 88 percent voted for McLean. I am very uh, cautious. Okay, people, can I just say one thing? Um, I just want to say, to, when, when Roosevelt, um, during his era, put the New Deal uh, with uh, Social Security and welfare and job bill and all those things came between him and uh, et cetera, that's when affirmative action was white. Those things were not offered to black people. 
black people did not, could not get Social Security, could not get disability, could not get the GI Bill, could not get any of those things. It was not until this was largely white and poor white that experienced those, got those benefits. And that was a struggle. We had to struggle even with Roosevelt. That's right. I think we don't want to get like you say, and, and most of the black people at the time had jobs as domestics, and those jobs or were farmers. not covered. You see, right. the farmers, they were not covered. Um, I'm going to do a housekeeping note. If you have this, it's a cell phone, I would love for you to try to call it off. Thank you. 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 Thank you law and order, but it also had to do with um, the strategy that folks who were in these progressive coalitions tried to adhere to, um, first in the New Deal era where they, they tried to work within the confines of, of government policies. Um, and then, of course, being frustrated with the fact that, you know, even with Brown versus Board of Education, with all the way with speed meant pressure to County Maryland, essentially to segregate their public schools in 88. <laughs> so, what I'm asking you is, do you see, I think black folks in America especially have continued to see legal redress as a viable option. It may be slow, but it's a viable option. Is it still a viable option? Should we still put faith there? Or does it need to be tempered with a certain type of activism that we saw in bygone era that possibly needs to be reinvigorated at this time. And I know that you're involved sure. in this every day. So could you kind of talk about that and also talk about it in the Philadelphia context? Absolutely. Um, is this working? Um, no. <laughs> um, April, great question. And uh, before I begin, I want to thank WURD 900 AM. Uh, and so the I'm hearing Dr. Palmer, I'm hearing Dr. Sunken, I'm saying I wish everybody could hear it. And thanks to Dr. Lomax and WRD, a lot of folks are hearing this and voting updates. Let's give them another round of applause. Having said that, um, if we pose a very good question, I think in terms of the law as a type of refuge for black folks, so there is some, I think, cautious optimism. But before I even address that, let me say this about myself. I always start out by saying, I'm not a lawyer who happens to be a black man. I'm a black man who just happens to be a lawyer because I certainly understand the difference. And I also say that as a lawyer, I don't go into court to get justice. I actually go into court to expose the injustice. So the victory is not necessarily getting the Supreme Court to do the right thing or the appellate court to do the right thing, but it's to push in their face the contradictions so glaringly, like this, for example, let's look at the Amadou Diallo case and a black man being murdered and shot down and the police officer walking away. Well, we didn't need a judge or a jury to say that was police brutality. Black folks could see it, and the contradictions were made that much more inherent by them just walking away from a situation like that. So, um, but we certainly, as I say, we can use the law to beat the law. Um, a lot of times, lawyers, I think, put too much faith in the legal system, but I'm not that naive. Um, I understand that slavery was legal. Apartheid was legal. Women not having the right to vote was legal. So, you know, there's a difference, as I always say, in court between law and justice. Law is just the rules that some powerful people put together having very little often to do with justice. But having said that, um, whether you love basketball or hate basketball, if you're on the court, you gotta follow the rules. Whether you love baseball or hate baseball, when you're in the field, you gotta follow the rules. So as a lawyer, I try to use the system to beat the system, and it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, I think what we have to do, as I say, as lawyers, we have to raise issues in court while the people raise hell on the streets. It has to be a two-pronged effort. We're not going to win with just lawyers going into court to make legal arguments. We're not just going to win with people on the street raising issues. It has to be a concerted effort. And if that takes place, it'll happen. Um, and before I wrap this up, because I certainly want to hear more from Dr. Asante and Dr. Palmer, a great example of using the system to beat the system. 
and in looking at this documentary, we see the police brutality rampant. Um, back in October of 1998, an unarmed black teen here in Philadelphia named Donta Dawson was shot and killed by the police. And by the way, Philadelphia is notorious for being, um, I think, one of the best police departments in terms of police brutality. If there were a textbook on how to commit police brutality, the Philadelphia Police Department would write it, so I would give them props for that. They do a great job of doing that. As a matter of fact, and people are shocked to hear this, Dr. Sante talked about Mississippi, we hear about Alabama, Texas, but the first city to be prosecuted by the federal government for police brutality was not in Mississippi, was not in Alabama was not in Georgia, was right here in Philadelphia. The first city to be prosecuted for police brutality, Philadelphia. Now having said that, you know, I look at lawyers often file civil rights um, lawsuits and all that's good. But the problem with civil rights lawsuits is that you get a judgment against the police department, which we as the taxpayers pay. So you win a multi-million dollar verdict, but what does that do to hurt the cop who pulled the trigger? In fact, my tax rates go, go, go higher and higher because now I'm the victim of police brutality, but my money pays me for being a victim of police brutality. So don't get me wrong, civil rights lawsuits are great, but it has to be something that forces the police officer himself or herself to pay the price. Now, this is right, I mean, I grew up in North Philly, um, and growing up on the streets is a good experience because you learn to think quickly. You learn to think outside the box. And when I went to law school, I was able to get that book knowledge. And using that street knowledge and that book knowledge, that's a dangerous combination. <laughs> a dangerous combination. That's why I say if many of these young drug dealers actually went to business school, they put Bill Gates to shame in terms of what they could do. But having said all that, so I'm a lawyer from North Philly, and I'm looking at police brutality, and I heard about this case from October of 1998 when an unknown black teen down to Dawson was shot and killed. And the black community was up in arms, outraged, and we were protesting and demonstrating, trying to get the DA here in Philadelphia, Lynn Abraham, to file charges. For the first few weeks, she wouldn't, first couple months, she wouldn't, and finally, she played a trick. It's a long story, but I'll wrap this up in two minutes. She decided to file manslaughter charges against police officer Christopher D. Pasquale. And politically, it was a shrewd move because by filing manslaughter, first of all, she delayed and delayed, hoping that the black community would go away, and it wouldn't. So she came up with a shrewd technique. She filed manslaughter charges against the police officer killing Don Dawson. But she knew as a lawyer that using a firearm on a vital body part of another human being is not manslaughter, it's murder. Basically, the difference between murder and manslaughter is one is an intentional act, the other is unintentional. Basically, that's it. So if I drop a gun because I'm playing around with it and a bullet discharges and somebody dies, that's manslaughter. But if I take that same gun and put it to somebody's head and pull the trigger, that's murder. So Lynn Abraham knew that, but she charged manslaughter and the black community was appeased because they didn't know what the law really was. So the case went to court, the judge said, what the hell is this? This is not manslaughter, threw it out. DA came back the second time and threw it out. So she was able to politically posture and blame it on the judges. But the judges did what they were supposed to do because they were brought a manslaughter charge. They knew it was not manslaughter. So what am I doing? I'm sitting here looking at the law and I'm thinking, as a criminal defense attorney, I know the difference between murder and manslaughter. And I also know something about something called a private criminal complaint. Private criminal complaint was a law passed by the state legislature way back in 1968. And again, I'll wrap this up in less than a minute and a half. So this private criminal complaint law was designed to deal with nuisance cases. If your next door neighbor had a son who was constantly throwing a ball around outside and the ball repeatedly broke your window, you call the police and they say, Mr. Smith, we can't come out there to arrest a kid for a ball. Go downtown and file a private criminal complaint because it was designed to bypass the police and bypass the district attorney to take you right into court to get a judge to order charges against the kid who constantly breaks your window. So I'm reading it and with my street sense from North Philly, I'm saying the law simply says, if you have a complaint that the police won't respond to, if you have a complaint that the district attorney won't respond to, you can file this private criminal complaint, bypass them, and go straight into court. So I'm reading this and I'm saying, hey, this cop shot and killed Dante Dawson. The police won't do anything about that. 
The DA won't do anything about that. I'm going to file a private criminal complaint. And it, as Muhammad Ali said, it shook up the world. Because once we filed this private criminal complaint, we got into court, and for the first time in Philadelphia history, for the first time in Pennsylvania history, as far as we know, for the first time in American history, an on-duty white police officer was charged with the murder of a black man when a judge granted my prior criminal complaint motion on April 6, year 2000, at 10.37 a.m. And I remember that because I framed the court order. And that was the first time that that had happened. And since that time, it's been rare. In fact, there hasn't been one case in Philadelphia since then where the police concede that the black person they shot and killed did not have a weapon. There's been a lot of black men and women killed by police since then, but at least the police are smart enough to say the guy had a gun or the woman had a gun. But in regards to Don Dawson case, they had to concede that he didn't have a gun. My point is this. Even though the cop ultimately didn't go to jail on this Don Dawson case, what we did was we forced the police now to think first and then fire second because first they would fire the shots and then ask questions later. But my point is because on April 6th, year 2000, first time in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania history, we got a cop to be charged with murder. Now the police know that if I shoot this black guy who's unarmed, I could face murder charges and go to Greaterford State Prison. So what we did was we used the system to beat the system and that's the only way it's ever going to work. Thank you. Do they sell that North Philly intellect? Can we get that in the bottle? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it is now your opportunity to join in in this conversation. We've been having mic problems, as you can tell, so I'm coming out and doing my Oprah Winfrey thing. So what I would love for you to do is to come up to this mic and tell us who you are, and if you're from Philly or not from Philly, tell us where you're from, where your neighborhood is, and join in. Who would like to go first? All right. Hi, my name is Connie Billet, and I feel multiple uh, connections to this because I grew up very close to Newark, but I came here to go to college and I've been here ever since. And so that way, and I graduated in 64, so just from high school in 64, so during that period that this was about, that was, you know, that formative time in my life. Um, and to some extent, um, I thought the discourse to the pillar, and, um, and I, I wanted to get back on that track because I think my question is, well, where do we go now? I don't think that the movements that I, as a white radical at the time, was involved with, which became divorced at the, in the late 60s from the black power movement, I don't think we I mean, how the hell could we have gotten to George Bush if we were effective? So what do we do now? I'll buy your argument we're not post-racial. But, okay. That's, in a sense, irrelevant. What do we do now? Because I look at school system right now in Philadelphia, that's worse, worse than it was in 68. It's worse. And I'm looking at housing situations and the division between the haves and the have-nots, that's worse now. So what have we done? And what are we going to do? That's what I'd like to have you guys address. Excellent question. Good question. <laughs> in 1967, uh, former Mayor Richardson Dilworth uh, was the Chairman of the Board of Education. At that time, he said, uh, before even we were doing the protest against the Board of Education, he said that Philadelphia was turning out functional illiterates. And he said that over 50% of the children, this is 1967, okay, over 40 years ago, were functional illiterates and could not back an envelope. He, that should have told folks something. And at that time, the majority of the system was African American, and we were really protesting, right? Because and you had very few uh, black teachers. Nineteen after that strike, we were calling for community control of schools and trying to get people involved in schools. We were trying to get more um, freedom schools. The government intercepted, interceded, and they set up freedom schools. When you hear the term freedom schools now, these are usually government-sponsored freedom schools. They're nice but they're more like summer camps and, and tutorial programs, not like the freedom schools we were talking about. In the 1987 or so, I started fighting, I started going all over the country, trying to push for vouchers and charter schools. 
And the reason was I was trying hard to move uh, uh, and join the movement, which had been around long before that, it's been around 30, 40 years, for trying to get to school choice um, uh, and trying to make the case that in the same light of the GI Bill, which had been um, deprived of, of blacks in the early days, that eventually the GI Bill allowed many blacks to eventually use that bill to get educated and to get housing, et cetera. And that black people should make a choice as to whether or not they wanted to stay in deteriorating schools. I graduated from West Philadelphia High School, where in about 300 children came in and about 300 children graduated. My high school now, some 50 or so years later, over 50% of the children will not graduate. And this has been going on for years, okay? In the Hispanic communities, almost the same thing. There's something wrong. And I contend that in many ways, the ones who dropped out are the smartest ones. They've come to realize there's something wrong. They've come to realize that they're not going to be cloned, and they're not going to be uh, uh, undermined, and they're not going to be more marginalized. They're the smart ones, okay? <coughs> Now, to people who want to maintain the status quo, they don't feel that way because they think what they ought to do is stay there until it gets better. And what I've said to people, if you think that they should stay to get better, you should bring your children and come to live in North Philly and South Philly and West Philadelphia and let the children and the parents of those children who you are talking about staying there go live in your houses and go to your schools until it gets better. We get no takers. We get no takers. So I said, so what is this argument against people making choice? Because I also believe in homeschooling. And about almost 10% of Americans, I understand now, are doing homeschooling. So why don't we have people talk about real reform and real revolution? Uh, the voucher's argument was that that's kind of racist, and what will happen is uh, that will cream the crop, and only a few people will benefit. Well, every society needs a few people to benefit in order for the masses somehow to either use that as an example or to benefit from those who improve their condition. So the charter school movement eventually took hold. And between 1990 and 1997, I worked closely with Cardinal Bevilacqua here in the city and Governor Ridge. And because the teachers' union was in opposition to that, there was tremendous resistance, uh, the, neither one would be passed. But in 1997, there was a compromise made where, in fact, the union said, well, if you don't push for vouchers, we'll support, we'll let, we won't fight against charter schools. And so Act 22 came into existence in 1997. In the state of Pennsylvania, there is 120 charter schools now. 73 of them are in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has the largest number of charter schools. And Philadelphia has charter schools which for the most part have some 30,000, 40,000 children in them. 30 or 40,000 children on the waiting list. I'll use the one I started. I started one in the year 2000. When we first started we had a, we had to take an old building, Carish, uh, uh, Catholic parish at 2nd and Jefferson, which was built for the Irish when they were being discriminated against in the 1800s. Remember the Irish were the, considered to be the other niggers of the world, okay? And so they were being discriminated against, and so they built the parish um, in 1854, so 1856, because they were being beaten, killed, and hung in the streets of Philadelphia. We were able to get that parish. We had to put a half million dollars in and try to prove it. We had 300 seats for children from kindergarten to fifth grade. 500 people showed up because of the work we'd been done at Blackfield University from the 1950s. And so we could not get more in. When we first started, we had as many as 300 to 400 suspensions in the first year. Now, seven years later, we have almost 1,000 children from preschool to high school. We have less than 100 suspensions. We have 94% daily attendance. We have no bars on the windows, no graffiti on the wall. The second thing, audacious freedom, by the way, that's the term I gave to that. I mean, the, the term audacious freedom is, is, is uh, through my consultancy with the institution. So I, I recognize that and I'm very supportive of that exhibition, by the way. And if you get a chance, it's going to be a real powerful exhibition. But, but, the, but the whole notion of audacious freedom is that we have always struggled against all forms of, uh, of, of, of oppression and police brutality has certainly been one of them. And, um, and the, third, uh, the, the third issue I think is for me uh, one that I just want to leave uh, probably with the, to, the, to the other, uh, other uh, panelists. 
Yeah, the, um, I'd like to say that um, the, you, this is a predominantly white society. If we talk in terms of where the society is going to be in the next 30, 40 years, it's, it's anticipated by the year 20, it used to be 2050, now it's 2040, that it'll be a largely non-white society. Because what will happen is that the Hispanic and Latino populations are growing at such rapid pay rates at almost 40% or so a year, um, that they will really outnumber all groups. They are today the largest minority. African Americans were the largest minority. Now the Hispanic and Latinos make up about 14%, where we make about 12% or more. And our numbers are not growing in the same, same way. Uh, and our African people, people in the African country, are not being allowed to come in. Even in immigration American society has a, a ebb and flow. And so when you put, this, put the step stankers on certain countries, that means it reduces the amount of people who are going to come in. So at 2040, 2050, they expect that maybe as many as 100 million people of Hispanic and Latino descent will be here, coming from much of the uh, South America as well as from um, you know, other parts of the world. And remember, Spanish is one of the largest spoken languages in the entire world, okay? And so that's going to happen. Um, the problem with that is, as that takes place, and, and uh, will in fact the African Americans position in American society diminish any further? Uh, they are, in fact, the, on the lowest level of the totem pole, on the social hierarchy of the totem pole, uh, but will it diminish any further? Will there really be meaningful coalitions, or will, in fact, the divisions that have taken place in American society also be carried out when, in fact, these new populations come in? Um, and because we know that racism is so endemic, so systemic in American society, the fear I have is that what will happen is that we will move from it being a predominantly white society in terms of numbers, but that nothing will change in terms of being a white society in terms of policy and politics. Because it is a cult, see racism is cultural, okay? And so we have socialized black people, white people, Hispanic, Latinos, all people into a racialized society. So white preference will still be with us, I think. But what happens in terms of non-white people, I do believe that what we'll have is light skin privilege dark skin disadvantage. We'll move from white skin privilege, black disadvantage, to light skin privilege, black or dark skin disadvantage. That goes for the Hispanic Latinos, as well as for blacks and other people from the Middle East and from Asia. I just believe that, that that's the trend that seems to be happening. Because remember, America really socialized all of us into wanting to be white. Italians who came to this country did not come as white citizens. Nor did the Germans, or the Irish, or the Polish. They are not white. But they were socialized into buying into whiteness. They were socialized. So as Du Bois says, you had to pay the wages of whiteness to be accepted as an American in this society. And what were those wages? Right, was, was to give up, to surrender who and what you were, to surrender your culture. So you surrender your language as Italian, you give it up. You, all the things that are so close with the Irish, you give that up. Uh, the Jews had to give up Yiddish, give it up. Some of their dietary laws, give it up. Don't wear the Star of David, don't wear the yarmulke, give it up. And other to be, but when you accept American society, you also buy into its discriminatory practices. You buy into your racialized society. You affirm the institutions that negate African people and women and Native Americans from participating fully in the society. And that's why I say, until we talk about dis de de deconstructing every vestige of discrimination in American society, we will not have this peace we're talking about. And so I see that. But in the meantime, institutions inside. See, I believe you can have free people in a slave society. Because remember, slaves have to participate in their slavery in order for slavery to be maintained. So there are many black people who will maintain, who will help to maintain it, because they themselves will buy into wanting to replace themselves with the white overseers. And women do the same thing. Women who are not equal to people in our society and men in our society will also go against other women who are fighting for their liberation. Yeah. Classic example, Bill Clinton, his misbehavior with Monica Lewinsky was only affirmed by many white women, right, and black women who accepted that behavior and turned against Monica Lewinsky without holding him accountable. And what it does is it sends a bad message to all the men, all the little boys in American society. 
guys like me and Malefi and Michael fighting hard to get these young black kids to act like men and take on men responsibility, trying to get them to respect women, respect their mother, their grandmother, and all of a sudden here's a society of people affirm the behavior of a man who sits at the highest seat in American society. There's no excuse for that. And so it will be the same possibly with regard to race. And so places of our possibilities are creating our institution with inside of a white society. I created the Black People's University, didn't ask permission in 1957. I created Black People's, uh, Black Men at Penn School of Social Work in, 19, uh, in, in 2007, 50 years later, didn't ask permission. Creating a black permanence inside of white institutions has been what I believe is the one thing that I think we can continually do. Friends like, you know, people who we know very well uh, who fought with us in the 50s and 60s, uh, Floyd McKissick. Floyd McKissick, a great man, a great uh, American who was in the civil rights, hit a, hit a core. He gave up American society and decided he wanted to create a black society somewhere in the Carolinas, okay? Lawrence Henry's brother, right, Milton, Milton Henry created the, the Republic of New Africa. He and his brother Mari went in to buy, uh, setting up a, a, their own country uh, or their own state inside of Louisiana. So you have to, real, and there was with limited, limitations. There are serious limitations for trying hard to not find ways in which to hold this country accountable, create and demand this permanence of, of dismissing or just deconstructing race in our society, and create joint institutions that are mutually respected within this society. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. So, are there people who have questions, a few more questions? I want to try to condense them all at once so we can do a last round. How many more? One, two, three. Okay, could you all come up? I'm going to have you ask your quick questions all at once. If you guys can, yeah, they can answer quick. And I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, we don't want you to stop talking. That's what God does. We don't want you to stop doing that. Okay. Your name and where you're from. My name is Margaret Baldwin, and I'm from South Philadelphia. Okay. I know Dr. Palmer really well. We work together. And I just want to say that um, since I've been here today, a couple of things that you all have said that while watching um, President Obama go into, you know, get his, um, take his oath, was three generations of us. And I said exactly what you said, Dr. Sante, about how America has just told white people, no matter how poor you are, that you are better than anyone black. And I have read articles where, I was just in, in a classroom the other day, where this young white woman was suffering. She didn't have any food, da, da, da. and I gave her the information to go where to go. And she said, I can't go to a food cupboard. You know? She said, I can't go to a food cupboard. And I, and I have read that in articles. And then I want to say to Dr. Palmer is that I had said to my children, when you travel around the world, there's no such thing as black people and white people. Mm -hmm. no. That was only created, yeah. okay? Yes. Only created because of slavery. Now, I'm, the family. Regina, I need your question. Okay. Well, I, well I'm a, it's not really a question. It's just question. that I just needed to say that the family is the most important institution. This is my question. Oh. The family is the most important institution. I have not heard any one of you say anything about how the African family can really come forward and do the things that we need to do to bring back the value system that we had when, when we came along. Thank you so much. Well. Your question, ma'am. <laughs> okay, my question I'm is... I'm sorry, you didn't even want your phone. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Antoinette Harris, and I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> and I came up here because I'm an um, uh, energy broker. Hmm. And one of the things that we're going to all have to bow down to is going to renewable sources of energy. That's right. So, one of the things that um, I have a question or a statement about, about is... We talk about charter schools not being enough. What I have created in Alexandria is after school programs with the focus on the 21st century, but also not forgetting that the people that are the indigenous people of the world and how they live, how we're gonna to have to live in the 21st century. So do you think that programs, since you can't get them all in charter schools, starting community programs based on uh, African or indigenous diaspora 
and connecting it to the renewable sources that we have to have in the future would be a good idea. Great. Next question, please. Thank you. Last question. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lisa Thompson, and I'm here from Hillsborough, New Jersey. And I just wanted to commend Mary Lou and Jerome on your film and the story. <laughs> it's wonderful to have uh, it as a tool to create dialogues like we're having here today. And, um, that's, I guess, the beginning of how change comes. I'd like to ask you if at some point, as a um, white woman, or as someone who's white, we talk here about white supremacy, um, I'd like to think that that's not something that I was brought up with. However, how do you see uh, white people who want to make a difference, how do you see our role in, in all of this? Beautiful question, thank you. Last, last brilliant question. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carrie Kempin. I'm a member of the PAC. I need the um, mic at your mouth. Yeah, yeah. The mic at your mouth. I'm Carrie Kemp. And my, my, my name is Carrie Kemp. I'm a member of a PAC. I'm known on WRD as Mary from Nice Town. That's my okay. radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm like I'm myself, um, but at the end, like, uh, what, uh, for one word, what could you say? Suddenly I was felt, I, I didn't have an answer right then because it left me in that stage. The, um, we have seen films like that, but I didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, is it true that that film will be shown in the public schools? It's going to be adopted in public schools? Yes. Um, I, that's good, but I think that um, <laughs> Uh, grade level, the children will be watching that film. It will leave them like it left me. I think before that film is shown, it should be some history of African Americans earlier so that children won't leave wondering why they were treated that way. If they have a little bit of history, it's according to what grade level you're going to show that film to. Small children should be taught, especially African American children, should be taught. Um, the beginning of their history and then go into that. But I think it's just yeah. a little yeah. too early yeah. just to put that in front of you. I'll defer to you. I'll defer to you. I'm just going to say, it's, I mean, if I can remember all the questions. The first one, yes, I agree. The family, the family I think the family is, is essential and important. And one way to start that is through uh, rituals such as Kwanzaa, which is a family uh, holiday. Uh, if you don't know about Kwanzaa, learn about Kwanzaa. It's very easy to, to get some information. It's a family holiday in the African American community, and it's one way to deal with values, because that's what it deals with, values. Children need to learn those values. Um, Renew yes, renewable so sources of energy, absolutely. Indigenous sources, I'm all for that. And I mean, and we, we, need, uh, we need to have schools that teach that and at a very early, a early age. And I'm very happy to hear that you're doing this in Alexandria. White I think supremacy. that's extreme. White supremacy, the only thing I would say is that I think that we all, you said that you don't, Grew up, you didn't grow up with it, we all grew up with it, if we live in America, all right? So you don't recognize it, that's the thing. You don't recognize the advantages that you have because your parents may not have taught you that you were better than black people, but the advantages that you have, uh, that you have inherited, uh, are, are, are definitely uh, based on the whole principle of white supremacy. Yeah, that's what I understand, and I and I and I and I, and I appreciate that. Uh, I would recommend, just as a just as a, a source, to read anything Tim Wise writes. W I S E Tim Wise. Everybody, right? everybody should read it. Right, and he, he you can look his look his name up. He's a journalist out of Tennessee, and he he is a, he is the leading I think for me the leading popular white writer on the question of racial privilege because he writes, he wrote a book about his own life 
in terms of what happened to him. And I think that that, because he didn't recognize it either, but I'll give you one example. He said his job when he was at Tulane University as a student was to go into the black project, to the projects in, in New Orleans and to keep black kids off of drugs. But at the same time, in his dormitory at Tulane University, all the white kids were doing drugs. But he said, but the problem is that they could do that because they knew no white policeman would come to their dormitory and arrest them. So he said, now I began to realize the things that I could do that black people were not able. So he, he writes from there and he talks about everything in society, even Sarah Palin. Can you imagine a black woman like Sarah Palin as, as not, uh, well, I mean, who doesn't know that Africa is a continent being put out for vice president, a black woman? Oh no, she would have been laughed out of, I mean, this would have gone nowhere. But anyway, he talks about that's, that's privilege, only white. It's white privilege to give you that opportunity to do that kind of thing. So at any rate, that's, then the last comment was, I agree with that lady so much. <coughs> oh, I don't know who you are, but yes, you are Mary. Yes, <laughs> Mary. Great question. And, and there is a comment. there is a curriculum that was written yeah. by the principal yeah. of the American History High School in Newark that goes along. Well, with I just hope that the, I don't I haven't seen the curriculum, but I just hope that they put it in the proper context because black kids will leave there angry, right. mad, upset. They will, they will not be, it will be so depressing. Wait, let me pause for a minute. We did this in Newark. There are some of you who were there. We had two young people on our panel, one Latino, one African American. We had an audience filled with kids from the Newark Boys and Girls Club, and they were really empowered by the film. And, and part of the reason why they were empowered is because they were on the dais on the panel discussion and they got to confront some of the adults about the lack of transmission of this information to the next generation. Thank so that's you. a very, very powerful thing for us to engage in. We didn't do it on this forum, but you know, and we also didn't have another woman besides Mary Lou and I recognize that. So we did ask some people that they weren't able to join us and we, we want to try to do that. Mary Lou, I want to talk, I want you to talk a little bit more about the curriculum piece. Very quickly. Uh, first of all, it's been done by Dr. Clement Price is our, you know, from Rutgers University is the person who's overseeing it as well as Margaret Krakow who's from Teachers College who did an incredible job, if you don't know it, with uh, Spike Lee's uh, Levy's documentary. So the educational component is very important to us. We spent many, many months working to make it uh, hands-on because history classes are normally not. And it's not just for a student or a group of students, it's for all students to understand this history and to, and to put it into the context of what they're learning. And I just want to say that I think the message from today, if anything, is about planning, work, and organization, which is certainly what we believe in and what we're working towards with sustainability and renewables, which uh, is you know, part of uh, what we're talking about today. Right, and, and the, uh, the value of having money. You know, this, what, what we've done today was only possible because you know, a great law firm has put their money into this to, to make it happen. So it's, it's important to go out and make that money so we can hear those messages. Amen. Um, I'm going to briefly respond to uh, two of the questions that were posed by the last uh, four persons. Uh, Dr. Santi did a great job, but Neil and Paul and I want to follow up on the last comment. The idea of lawyers and law firms doing the right thing is just incredible. So uh, let's give them a round of applause. Having said that, in terms of the role of whites, um, I, I'm glad that the young lady did pose that question. I saw a great documentary uh, last night uh, about the Black Liberation Army, and in terms of the role of whites, um, you know, some folks called it uh, robbing banks, but the BLA called it liberating funds. So they would get two white revolutionaries, man and woman, well dressed to drive the car. And the black guys would go in and rob the bank and jump in, so that they drive away, the police wouldn't think about it stopping the car because it was, a black, it was a white man and a white woman. So that's what you can do to help us. Um, <laughs> but, but, but having said that, I guess it comes down to what I say in terms of whites being a part of it. Ask 
but and not tell or follow but not lead. For example, I'm a feminist and every time I go to meetings dealing with women's rights, I'll just sit in the back and wait for marching orders for the, from the women who are leading it. I wouldn't dare go to a woman's meeting and say, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. I'll sit in the back and say, what do you need done? And that's what I'll do. And in terms of the historical context of blacks in the films, I'm glad the filmmakers made it clear that they put that together, but Mary did pose a great question. Thank you. And I think everything begins and ends with family. Everything. So I think we almost, almost take for granted that people know that, right? Because it's kind of clearly coming out of the African experience. Uh, the other thing is biotech is something that we have all talked about and longed for. We have to treat that everywhere. At our school, um, the school is based on the same principles of the 1950s. We teach leadership, social justice, and self-development. We're teaching children from preschool to high school to become leaders for social justice. They have to study hunger, poverty, disease, economics, uh, ecology, uh, racism, uh, child abuse, wife abuse, abuse of the elderly. We put together almost 100 different social indices that I've faced in my lifetime and our people have faced, and they put, I put it into curriculum. So they must, it's a requirement, the teacher has to be trained in that, the parents have to be trained in that. We have to train the next generation of people to become the social leaders that we want them to be. The, um, the other thing is that with regard to um, on whiteness, whiteness is a social construction. And when we talk about white privilege, we're not talking about, I'm not talking about the privilege that people earn. I'm talking about unearned white privilege. Um, they're people, when you, your father, mother, your grandparents, they all worked hard for what they got. And they, they got privileges as a result, and they're entitled. They, think they should get the same entitlements I get or anybody else gets. It is the unearned entitlements, which suggests that when a black child is born and a white child is born on the same day, that the white child has a preferential place in American society. And the probabilities of success are greater for the white child than it is for the black child. That's an unearned reasoning. Uh, the whole idea that when Ms. Margaret came up and said the fact that the poorest white people think, know that they're better than the, the richest black person, that's an unearned privilege. And so that's what you're talking about. All white people aren't rich, all white people aren't evil, and, and, and inherently evil, et cetera. So the whole idea is how do we look at this privilege? I'm a black man who came from total, unequivocal, abject poverty. 13 children and two adults living in two rooms, right, for all of my young life. I never knew what it was like to live and sleep in a bed without four or five other people being there, okay? Never knew what it was like to not have rats and, and roaches and bed bugs in my childhood growing up. But I became a middle class person. I fight hard for every person to be able to change their condition and become middle class. There's nothing inherently wrong with being middle class, except when you get stuck and think that's where you ought to stay. I mean, you ought to get beyond even middle class. So I think that we have to get to look at whiteness in that, in, in that way. And finally, I would hope that what came out of this with regard to the filmmakers, that you recognize the fact there's a real opportunity to talk about the models which came out, the history which came before, the condition which created the climate, uh, of the riots of 67 in Philadelphia, 68 in Philadelphia on Columbia Avenue. What are the conditions in all these cities and watch, et cetera? And then what are some of the things that came out of it? Like I talked about, I gave a number of different things that came out of this movement during the time period. Almost everything I, I rattled off here was institutions and agencies like the Black United Fund. We created that right here in Philadelphia. It became national, but it was started here, okay? So if you look at the models, right? So there's the precursor, there is the condition which explodes it, and then there are the benefits that come as a result of people deciding to create institutions inside of institutions. It's not the same, the fact that it's a predominantly white society. And finally, I have a website I'd like you to go to. It's I-A-R-S-J. I-A-R-S-J dot org. Me and a number of my white students at the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach, five years ago, worked to try to create a dialogue for people across America. Our goal was to try to find a way to get over a million people across America of every nationality, race, religion, and origin to begin the process of signing up on this website at no cost, okay, to have dialogue about race and racism in America, the unfinished work that has to be done. It's I-A-R-S-J.org. Is that It's the, it's the, it's the, 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 web, the, the website numbers are what's critical, if, if we could change it a little bit. But to please go there and let us know what you think. Give us feedback, okay? Thank you so much. Great panel.
into uh, point you to the red folders that McCarter and English prepare for you. It has so much valuable information. There is an order form for the film if you are interested in the film. There is a bibliography about the Newark riots if you want to learn more about that. I also included the fatalities list from the 67 riots so that you can see the names in the, in the, of these people and the language that was used to codify these folks and what happened to them. I think that's very important as a historical lesson as well. Um, one of the books that was recommended to me when I did my research about um, how the Philadelphia story unfolded was a book by Matthew Countryman called Up South, Civil Rights and Black Power in Philadelphia. Fascinating read, fascinating read. It's not included in there. I just wanted to let you know about it again. I'll put it on the Civic Frame website. There's a lot of Civic Frame information in the folder as well. Of course, the biographies for our wonderful panelists. Um, and, and information where you can also be in touch with them because they are luckily here. They are yours in Philadelphia, and that is a treasure that uh, we are all envious of. Um, you are at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. How many of you are members? Not enough. Here are forms. We really, in order for us to be able to come here and do these programs, thank God for McCarter and English because it was free for you today because McCarter and English put their money behind it. But in order for them to bring me back and to do more programs that will be free, you will need to become members. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have these here. Um, please come up to me, don't be shy. Get these from us and, and, and join this, this museum, become active as a part of this community. They are doing fantastic things and everybody knows with this economy, it's hard to do a lot of things, but you get to do it here for a little bit of money and you get a lot out of it. So um, I wanna thank the Civic Frame Board of Directors and Advisory Board, uh, Yvonne Garrett and John Wright, my parents, Dr. Cornell West and Tavis Smiley, Wendell Phillips, Tyrone Jones, Michelle Harbin, um, Brian Jackson, Ellen Bailey, Suzanne Malveau, uh, Pamela Malveau, uh, the filmmakers, Mary Lou Tabato Bongiorno, Jerome Bongiorno, McCarter and English LLP, McCarter and English LLP, McCarter and English LLP. <laughs> When the riots came, we saw this film, when the riots came, almost every corporation in the city rolled out. They stayed. They stayed. It's a major, major statement. And then they're also in Philadelphia, so you know, you guys are lucky too. I'm biased because I like the Newark office. Um, but they are amazing. Um, Richard Barron, Howard Kells, uh, Peter, that I just met today, who apparently knows these people up here, so he's got to be really, really cool. Um, April, you know, um, yeah, Mike, 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 no, Mike talked about, about Lloyd. I mean, I, I went to law school, Maddie yeah. Humphreys, and, and, yes. and by the way, and the reason we went was for the rare, for a reason, because lawyers just sent me in the civil rights movement were not really prosecuting cases like the way that Mike does. Right, right. So we, we, we are so happy. Um, Dr. Asante, uh, Dr. Ray Hunter, Dr. Palmer. Now, let me tell you what happened. And, 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 and you, April, we're in New York. Luckily, uh, the radio station, WURD, got an opportunity to uh, interview him at length. So hopefully the, the listening audience got to, to hear him. But I want to especially thank Dr. and Mrs. Lomax. I don't know if they're still they here. Just but but they them. are amazing. What WURD did for us today by putting this on the air was amazing. Thank you for hanging in there with us and have a wonderful weekend.